welcome back to Let's Play Final Fantasy X. This is the last episode of this Let's Play series, and if you have watched the previous episode, you would have seen that we had just defeated Braska's final Aeon, meaning Sin is dead. Of course, that doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot, considering the fact that Sin is nothing more than armor for Yu Yevon, so any Aeon can become Sin over again, as long as Yu Yevon is allowed to possess it. The only way to stop this is to kill Yu Yevon. But the only way to get to Yu Yevon is to defeat all of our Aeons. So that's what's going to have to happen here. Yuna! cycle here of Yuna going and uh, summoning an Aeon, the Aeon getting possessed by Yu Yevon, effectively becoming the new Sin, then we defeat it. Now these things are becoming Sin, but the thing is, Sin takes a while to build up. The final Aeon is always a smaller thing. It would defeat Sin, and then it would get possessed by Yu Yevon, and it would take years, like 10 years for it to be built up in size into the gigantic whale creature that we had fought throughout the game. So here we are, fighting the small version of Sin that is still just the Aeon that we had counted up at this point. Now it's necessary that we kill these things, because if any of them get away and they manage to hide for ten years, they'll become Sin again, and, well, back when we start. Now notice I'm using Shiva to fight this veil for here. And you can summon Aeons to fight this battle for you, though it's not really necessary. But take note that after we have killed an Aeon, we cannot summon it. We cannot bring Veil 4 back and use Veil 4 in this in this battle here. Because it's dead. Once we kill Shiva, we will use Shiva anymore either. So here we are, we got another option. Who are we gonna fight next? Let's go straight down the line. If we're gonna be next, good old fire monster. Just by you, Yevon. And we'll kill him. Now these monsters are not going to be very difficult. But that's not what makes this really easy to not what makes this boss battle really easy to win. It's the fact that you are literally invincible. All of your characters have auto life infinitely cast on them. Meaning if they got knocked down, they would instantly be summoned or uh, revived. And this would happen over and over and over and over again. You could sit there and let them get killed all day and they keep coming back. I can't even think of a way you would lose this fight. Which is why I consider the boss battle at the end of the last episode to be the actual boss battle of this game. Braska's final Aeon is the boss of this game, and all this other stuff is more of a cinematic battle you have to go through to show you the end of the game. One hit ought to do it. Very nice. Overkill effect.
holy. Overkill. So she was dead. I like the way that the summer creatures are treated in this game. Because in the early Final Fantasy games, I guess up until the until eight, the summon creatures were mostly just spells that you brought out. You had a summoner class, or you had summoner items. In Final Fantasy VII, you had summoner materia, which could be equipped on any character. But Final Fantasy VIII came around and sort of made the summon creatures part of the story of the game. They weren't really that important. I mean, they were just sort of things occasionally referred to in conversation. Oh, the Guardian Force monster is there. What make us strong and all that. And they were what erased the character's memory so they didn't remember their childhoods. And then, uh, they became even more important in Final Fantasy IX, where they became the, like, the object of fascination and power and all that for the first half of the game or so. Everybody was after the, uh, I guess they were called Idolins in that game. Everybody was after the Idolins because they were a source of power, and the Queen wanted them, and what was that guy's name? The bad guy. He wanted them and all that kind of crap. Final Fantasy X, though, took it to a whole new level. And the Aeons in this game, or some creatures in this game, were very, very central to the entire role of the game. I mean, here we are. At the end of the game, we have to fight them. And they're not only the thing that is supposed to help save the world, but they're also the thing that we're destroying the world. I mean, the Aeons are central in the story of Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy XII didn't really follow through with that, and it became more of a, a side thing back in that game. See, uh, 13, the way they treated the summoning creatures. You know, they appeared in the storyline, but they were... They weren't really terribly important to the overall story. There were just sort of things that appeared. All of that. But here we are, killing off all of our Aeons back again. Bahamut's dead. Well, I guess uh, we have Yojimbo and the Mega Sisters left. Whoops, forgot about Anima. Even these more powerful Aeons are really no match for our characters. Even if they could be defeated, I mean, we could still slaughter the Aeons. Dog. Oh, no, oh, there it is. Possessed. And to think, this guy was only in it for the money. 
I don't know what Yojimbo would have done with the money, but he wanted money to take our side in this fight. And now we're gonna go kill him. summon Aeon in the game. This is also the last opportunity that Yu Yevon would have in order to jump into a piece of armor and survive. Remember this is not Yu Yevon, uh, Yu Yevon's intention to be this blight on humanity. It was just sort of an attempt, or misguided attempt, to save Xanarkin. In reality, Yu Yevon has no control over what's happening here. Yevon is little more than a, than a creature, a force of nature at this point. Cindy die. This'll do it. Everyone, this is the last time we fight together. Okay? Huh? What I'm trying to say is, after we beat you, Yevon, I'll disappear. What are you talking about? I 
I'm saying goodbye. Not now. I know it's selfish, but this is my story. This is it. This is Yu Yevin. This is the source of sin. This guy was a summoner back in Xanarkin, and it was his attempt to save Xanarkin, which gave birth to the dream world Xanarkin, as well as sin. Of course, he had very, he had absolutely no control. I don't think Yu Yevin ever intended to become this horrible monster that went and well, killed everything in his way. So, um, it, this is kind of... He takes the form of a little bit of a tragic villain. Now, actually, defeating Yu Yevin in this fight can be a little bit tricky, even though it is impossible for you to lose the fight, because look how much he cures himself for every round. Now, if you have weaker characters, that can be a little bit of a problem. If you have stronger characters, stronger than they have right now, you can just bash him until he dies. But as it is right now, only Yuna can consistently deal more than 9,999 points of damage. Oh, that looks painful. We hurt himself there, too. And Power Wave is going to launch as well. Doing a little bit of curing on to Yu Yevin as well. there. Now, the strategy you may want to do in the event that you cannot simply bash it into the ground is to cast Zombie which is what I'm trying to do Why I have Riku out here. Riku's weapons have the effect zombie touch on them. So when she goes and attacks, it uh, would inflict zombie status, but it doesn't always happen. Casting Reflect, which is what Yuna had just done, is another method of doing it. See what happens when Reflect is cast on Yu Yevin. Yu Yevin attempts to cure itself. Bell bounces off and cures one of the characters. Now, when I have zombie status on you, Yevin, which is what I'm trying to do with Riku, and I think it, the yeah, status might actually be on there. When you, Yevin, cures, provided it gets through the reflect shell, it will actually hurt you, Yevin, rather than heal him. So if he can consistently have the zombie status, the, zo the battle will be really short. And that may have removed the reflect shell as well as the zombie status. Oh, no, zombie status is still on. Oh, now it's off. It cured itself. I don't know what Yu Yevin is supposed to look like here. It's kind of a weird... What is that? Eight-legged bug? Ten-legged... I don't know. Bunch of legs. I can't really see it. The screen's a little small. With the... Oh, no zombies has. Well, with the Yevin symbol on there. That's most of his HP intact. Steel MP. Rap bastard. How's Yuna supposed to launch her attacks without any MP? Huh, <laughs> counterattack. A lot of good that did. Can't perform Grand Summon because we have no Aeons. Even if you did, if you brought it out, you can just possess it. Use an Aether and get her magic back. Why are you doing that? He's just gonna heal himself. There we go, zombie stabs. And he hurts himself rather than heals. Power wave should also hurt it rather than heal it.
Let's throw a couple of underdog secrets at this bastard. Let's see what happens here. Nice damage. That happened even though Yuna didn't, or not Yuna, Riku didn't even have. Riku didn't even have break damage limit on her weapon, and she still managed to perform twice the normal top level damage. Ah, damn, her zombie status is off. Slice and dice is something you sometimes want to use on single enemies, even though it's made to attack multiple enemies. Because Titus may break the damage limit with this and perform a whole lot of damage. It only really happened with the first attack, but that was still worth it, even though you have him cure. Take him down, Yuna. As long as he do more damage than he can cure himself with. Don't do that. No, don't. Jeez. As long as he can do more damage than he can cure himself with, he'll be good. Or, in the case of Riku, you can inflict zombie status. Damn it! Still doesn't have it. Don't attack. EMP, just defend. Excellent, he's hurting himself again. Go to town, Yuna. Actually, we should be pretty close to the end of this fight. And, there we go.
all the statues that were the statues of the faith are going to start turning to stone because the the faith have died which is really what they wanted so I don't feel bad for them Forms are sending. I imagine the sending is for the entire city of Xanarkin. Don't stop. But I. has done what he's cam come here to do. He can die now. Titus was the only one that knew that he was dead. It's been long enough.
have to go. I'm sorry I couldn't show you Xanarkin. Goodbye. Oh. Hey. We're gonna see you again. You know. Ha Yuna, it's time. Everyone... Everyone has lost something precious. Everyone here has lost homes, dreams, and friends. Everybody? Now, Sin is finally dead. Now, Spear is ours again. Working together. Now we can make new homes for ourselves and new dreams. Although I know the journey will be hard, we have lots of time. Together, we will rebuild Spira. is ahead of us, so let's start out today.
Never forget them. And that is it. That is the end of Final Fantasy X. It was a relatively long game, and it took me something like seven or eight months or so for me to complete this LP series for it. And I'd say it was probably it was worth it, I think, because it was a good game, and I do like a lot of the characters. But now that we have a few minutes before the credits complete, I want to go talk a little bit about what I thought about the game and the different aspects of it. First things first, we have the character of Titus. Now, a lot of people do not like Titus. They look at him, has a little bit of an androgynous appearance, blonde hair, doofy looking face, and he whines a lot. And, granted, he is a bit of a pain in the ass. But overall, towards the end of the game, his character changed a little bit. And it especially got to that point when he realized that if he were to go and defeat Sin and destroy Yu Yevon and wake up the Xanarkin dream world, he would die. And he knew this was going to happen, but he continued to go on with it anyway. Which is sort of similar to what Yuna was doing. Because Yuna was taking on her pilgrimage, knowing full well that if she were successful, she would die. Now, Titus didn't like the fact that Yuna's went and held that secret from her. But he was willing to go and do kind of do the same thing to her. Now, Yuna, why she was willing to go through with the pilgrimage to begin with, maybe it's just because she felt like she had to live up to her father, maybe she felt like it was the only thing she could do, or maybe she had nothing to live for, who knows. But I think maybe it had something to do with she wanted to have some sort of a connection with her father, because her father died when she was, what, uh, ten or so? Or maybe eight? She didn't... Well, it's been a long time since he had died at this point, ten years, and she wanted to have some greater connection with him, so they could all be a summoner just like him. Maybe that's why I think she had that connection with Titus in the beginning of the game, because... She sort of fell in love with him pretty quickly, but that couldn't have been the reason why she wanted him to go around with her to begin with, to follow her around. I think it's because she knew that he was Jack's son, and Jack was her father's guardian, and she wanted to have some sort of a connection through that way. Or maybe I'm just overthinking this. Moving on a little bit, you had a character like Waka. Waka, <laughs> a big kind of goofy guy. I think... He, it was important that Waka exist in the storyline, in the beginning and in the middle of the game, but later on he sort of faded away. But in the beginning it was important because Waka was um, a factor in what got Titus involved in Yuna's pilgrimage. Waka wanted Titus to follow him around, because not just because he wanted to play Blitzball for, wanted Titus to play Blitzball for Waka, but because Titus had some superficial resemblance to Waka's brother. Now, it, that ended up really being just coincidental. That's kind of a weird thing for them to do in a story, to have something that's completely coincidental. But it was coincidental, but Waka wanted them around because he felt like, oh, this is someone like his brother. And he kind of horsed around with Titus too, kind of like brothers would. But aside from Waka, we also have the character of Lulu, who was... A very important character earlier on in the game, and then, like Waka, she faded away a little bit later, because in the beginning, she was very much a driving force of the group as a whole. She was the oldest of the group, I believe. She was tw uh, 22 or 23 or so, and the rest of the characters were a little bit younger than that. Titus and Yuna were like 17. And she was sort of like the leader of the group. Uh, but she faded into the background a little bit after Orin showed up, he sort of sort of his dominance. Oren, on the other hand, is a much more of a stern character, and you can see back, he used to be a, um, he used to be a monk in one of the Yevon temples. He was sort of rejected or excommunicated or something like that, but he, but you see through the spheres that you find around Spear that he was a very, like, by-the-book kind of individual to begin with. And when we see him later on in the game, he is, isn't really so much by the book, but he's still very stern. But he considers himself to be the troublemaker. I mean, he's a person that everyone respects, everyone in Yevon respects. But he had also obviously had some problem with Yevon, and that had to do with because he knew Yevon was a lie, and it was really just convincing people to continue on with the cycle. 
and he didn't really much appreciate that, even if he didn't see no other alternative. Riku was... I'm not quite sure what the writers were trying to accomplish with Riku. Maybe uh, she was a semi-friendly uh, person that Titus met when he first came in the sphere, and she existed as kind of like a potential love interest that Titus would have at the beginning of the game. In fact, back when I first played the game, I... Uh, was wondering in the beginning whether which direction Tia's would go in, and especially with that weird dream he had in the beginning. But later on, I guess her character was more important to Yuna, trying to convince her to abandon her pilgrimage and do all that kind of stuff, than it than she was to other characters like like with Tia's and stuff. Another thing I want to quickly go over before I run out of credits is sort of the setting of this game. Now, in the earlier Final Fantasy games, like 1 through 6, everything was 2D, so you couldn't really draw much from the setting. But in Final Fantasy 7, they brought her on this really depressing, industrialized world. Final Fantasy 8 kind of continued with that, and 9 brought in that weird kind of fantasy setting, but it was still really depressing. Final Fantasy 10, on the other hand, went and had this really colorful world, but it was all capped off by this horrible monster that would kill everyone in civilization, so it was kind of a downer. And what we have here? Was Titus alive? Or was Titus dead? Now, I personally kind of like the idea that Titus is dead at the end of the game, although I know it's not true. This was the first Final Fantasy game that actually saw a sequel. The game Final Fantasy X-2 was released one or two or so years after this one. And it was kind of a weird, goofy continuation of the story, where Yuna, Riku, and a new character called Pain had discovered a sphere of a guy that looked like Titus, and the they thought it may have been him, but they didn't know for sure. Turns out it wasn't. It was some guy that lived back in Xanarkin. And he was trying to wake up this horrible monster or machine beneath Benthel. The, the game wasn't really all that good. I don't want to go too deep into that. But at the end of the game, with the best ending, Titus was in fact alive and resurrected. But I am really out of time here. And I'm going to have to end this episode. Thank you for watching this LP. And if you like what I've done here, I have a number of other LPs on my YouTube channel. Feel free to check them out. Thank you and goodbye.